So welcome to uh, September 18th, our September 18th um, RSS Club session. So um, I've been reading, I mean, uh, I've been um, building a website for, uh, for the team at Lever. And one of the things I've, uh, for that website is um, I wrote a section on all the um, courses, books, uh, slides, and stuff that I think are useful for us to use as reference as we move uh, um, um, uh, to use for the future. Um, and one of those books is called um, uh, Modern Statistics for Modern Biology. Um, and I, you know, I was looking through it a bit fast. Um, and I thought this could actually be useful because uh, there was a comment from one of you from last week that was like, oh, uh, all the plotly and interactive stuff was great, but maybe maybe I need more of a refresh of some of the, um, in, like how to make plots in general uh, instead of just the interactive stuff. Um, and so this is a, it's a fairly long chapter. I think we won't be able to finish it in today's session, but I think I wanted to walk through some of the parts of it. Because um, I think this, the way that uh, Susan Holmes and Wolven Huber present this, I think could be quite, quite useful. So just a little bit of story about who they are. So Susan is a professor at um, Stanford. Um, and um, she has been, she and Wolven have been running some uh, courses for biologists and so, um, Wolven, he is one of the first um, um, leaders in Bioconductor. Um, um, he works at a place called the uh, European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Heidelberg, Germany. Um, um, and um, so I've known him for several years, uh, or I've known of, of him um, for several years. Um, and Susan and I were both on the Bioconductor Community Advisory Board. So I see Susan every month for some meetings. Um, um, so that's how I know them. Um, and that's why like, you know, I was made aware of this book, right? Um, and one nice thing about this book is that it's um, uh, pu publicly available through this website. Um, okay, so that's some of the stuff here. Um, I put on the R stat schedule all the packages that they use on this book by just searching the library commands for that chapter. There's quite a bit of, 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 uh, of R packages. Um, um, but I thought we could just uh, use this um, website um, and uh, maybe play around a little bit. So, um, so this book, Susan and Wolfman, they're showing us some good practices that, or some things that you should take into consideration for making a plot. Um, and um, like I, in my in a meeting, in my weekly meeting with one of you, um, I was like, oh, maybe this could be useful for some of those plots too. Um, so let's revise some of those concepts. Um, and then a lot of the book, uh, a lot of this chapter is spent um, learning uh, ggplot2. Uh, so we already had a session about uh, ggplot2 and the grammar for graphics. Um, so maybe we can um, uh, go through that a little bit faster, uh, but it could also serve as a refresher. Um, and then the last sections of the chapter um, show how do you how you can visualize data along the genome, which is something that is of interest to to us. Um, but I think this in itself is a topic that we could just spend a session on. Uh, so I don't think we'll cover that today. All right, so uh, Susan and, and Wolfgang, they start with a data set called DNAs. Um, uh, um, so this is one of the data sets that is included in R um, as an example data set. And in, it has three variables, a run variable, a concentration variable and a density uh, variable. Um, and so R is quite powerful and there's something called what we call now base graphics in R. And um, one of the functions in, in, the, in, 
in the base graphics is the plot function. That name, base graphics, where does it come from? There's actually a package called graphics, which is always installed when you um, install R. So like, if we really, um, check on our R window, question more uh, plot. Um, we'll see that, um, um, let me make this bigger. Mm -hmm. You'll see that we're, I'm looking at the function plot.default from the graphics package. Um, so that's where the, the term comes from. So this is a very basic graph where you specify a next variable and a y variable, right? And so uh, you can see on my screen on the right side that leads to figure 3.2 here. They have concentration on the x uh, density on the y. Um, and so um, that might be useful enough for a lot of situations. And Andrew, he loves uh, base graphics because a lot of times um, it's just easy to make a plot <coughs> if you're familiar with, uh, with how they work um, uh, and just explore the data, right? So the main thing you might, you're making a graph because uh, a lot of times you just, you just wanna see the relationship between two or more variables, right? Um, um, and a basic plot can show you maybe the, the, main, the all the information you need. Now, base graphics have a lot of arguments on them. So for example, there's two arguments that are very similar, which are the Y lab and X lab, which are the, um, um, the labels for the accesses. Um, there's also this um, uh, fairly confusing looking argument, PCH, which is for the, basically the point size, um, uh, sorry, the point type, um, uh, then COL for a color. Um, and so you specify all those arguments, you can end up with a plot like this on, um, on um, figure 3.3. And this is a much fancier looking plot that has like um, a much more precise X axis label and a Y axis one. Um, uh, and you can see the, the information here as uh, little uh, crosses instead of circles. And the uh, little crosses here are a, little bit, are a bit more helpful to avoid as much of the overplotting that we see on the circles on figure 3.2. So figure 3.3 is nicer, and this is like, this might be good enough for a paper, right? Um, 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 and that's just a scatter plot. Base graphics includes other plotting functions. One of them is called the histogram or hist function. Another one is called the box plot function. And we, we use those quite frequently, especially the box plot one. Um, 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 and so that's how you can end up with like, for example, the, uh, a histogram of the density variable uh, or a box plot here of, um, uh, of the density on the y-axis given the different bronze on the x-axis, right? There's some things here that we, like uh, you might want to change, right? So for example, we can see the x-axis here on run is like we have a 10 then we don't have a label for the next tick. Then we have a nine. And so it's like, okay, this is not in order because then we have another tick and then a four and at the end we can see a tree, right? So uh, we might want to order them um, in some way. And so that can take us a little bit of work right, um, to do. Um, 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 and so at the point when you want to start like customizing things, um, uh, you can do th you can do a lot of things with base graphics, but uh, ggplot2 actually provides like um, um, a pretty good framework for making a lot of plots with a very similar syntax. Um, so the idea is that if you learn ggplot2, you might have to learn um, you might have an easier time learning how to make high quality graphs with R than if you use base plot based plotting graphics. You use based plotting graphics, you have to learn about um, a bunch of different functions 
each of them has a, the, its own set of arguments. And then you might have to then start learning like how to, you know, uh, edit those arguments to make what you want. The grammar graphics, like we've talked about in the past, is um, implemented in, as a package in R called ggplot2. Um, and the idea is that you're going to build layers of information that you can you know, visualize um, you know, through multiple layers. Um, so, uh, Wolven, being a biconductor person, right? He used for his book a package called Hiragi. I mean, him and Susan used a, um, a package called uh, Hiragi 2013, which I'm assuming is the, um, uh, contains the data for um, a paper that was published in 2013. Um, and so the data that, that this package provides um, uh, is on a very specific bioconductor type of object called expression set. Um, uh, most of you probably haven't heard that term because nowadays we use summarized experiment, uh, but expression set is kind of the predecessor to summarized experiment. It was another, um, in, um, it was highly used when we were working with microarray data. Um, and it was a way of trying to organize microarray experiments. Um, um, and so this is actually a microarray data set from, uh, nowadays we use Illumina sequencing. Um, before it was Affirmetrix microarrays, right? That was the dominant company in the field. Um, um, and then one of the first normalization methods uh, that actually became really popular and uh, it, um, basically jump-started a lot of this field is the RMA method. This was developed by, by Rafael Irizarry, who was um, uh, basically um, one of Andrew's PG advisors. Um, and he's also the person that recruited me to, to uh, him and uh, Ingo since he recruited me to, to, to Baltimore. Um, so these are like, Basically, all our academic family, <laughs> the people that are involved in all this stuff. Um, okay, so let's look a little bit about uh, that data. So you might be familiar with the function call data for summarized experiment. For expression sets, the function that did something similar was called p data, uh, and the p stands for phenotype data. Um, so from that phenotype data, we can just extract like the first two rows using the head function just to see what data we have. And so in this particular experiment, we have information about a file, uh, what was the day of the embryo, um, the total number of cells that they had, the genotype. So this is basically like the diagnosis variable for us. Um, case control, in this case, it's like genotype, wild type, or something that they edited. Then there's always some batch effects, right? So this is when the image was, uh, when the data was processed, so it's scanned date. Right, when they scan that image, the microarray image, um, the sample group, what color they want to use for that. So this is a um, hex color for it. So um, this is a use. This they chose this data set because it's um, um, small enough that you can use it for examples, but complicated enough that you might need to view, visualize the data across multiple dimensions. Um, so, um, <clears throat> okay, I've been talking a lot. Um, okay, so something that, uh, that um, plays really well with uh, ggplot2 um, and the grammar of graphics is having data organized um, um, in what's called uh, the long format or tidy format. And for that, the dplyr package is quite useful. And so this particular pack, uh, you know, dplyr function here, we've, we've played a little bit around with dplyr when using, um, when we looked at the um, tidy Tuesday examples in the past. And so there's a function in dplyr called group y. So uh, that's useful when here we're gonna look at our phenotype table and we're going to group by the sample group, so either like E3.25 or other options. Um, and we want 
what we want to know is how many entries do we have per sample group. So we're going to summarize that information. And here we're going to use this n function from dplyr, which is going to give us a number of unique observations for each sample group. And we want to extract the color for it. Right? So there's a sample color column here that we have hex codes for the colors. So that's one of them. Like if you want to see how that in color actually looks, what I typically do is I copy just copy paste and Google search color. Um, and then like Google will show us, you know, what color that is. So this is like um, a type of uh, purple or pink. Um, um, and so um, we're, we're building a small table here called groups. Um, and so we have now, we automatically get a column for the variable that we use for grouping by. So that's going to be sample group in our case. Uh, and then we created a column called N that has a number of unique observations and a color called color, which has the unique colors. There's actually only one color per sample group. That's why this code works. So we get a little table over here and dplyr provides uh, what's called a table R object, right? Um, which is similar to a data frame. So that's a little bit of how, you know, they can summarize some of that data. Um, and I'll skip this stuff about the, the, um, the pipes, which we've talked about in the past. Uh, I do like their, their little notes here, like this like, little devil looking thing. I, I found that really funny when looking at their book. Um, all right, so now that we stand, understand a bit like how we can organize the data and make it tidy, uh, let's go back to understanding like the basics of ggplot2 right, and the grammar of graphics. So we're going to make that same plot that we made using base R uh, graphics with the DNA's data set. But now we're going to use the grammar of graphics um, implemented in ggplot2. So you load the package ggplot2. And the way you run this is you use the ggplot function. You specify what data set you want. Then you specify the aesthetics for it. Aesthetics is abbreviated as the function AES. Um, and so here we can specify what variable we want on the x-axis, what variable we want on the y-axis. And, uh, and then after that, we need to choose how we're going to represent the data. Right? So we, um, this portion, ggplot, Right, that just specifies what data are we working with and like where we want the data to show, right? Like on the x-axis, y-axis, et cetera. But we haven't specified it, how do we actually want to visualize it? And that's where we use functions that add layers to our graphic. And one of those functions is called the geom point uh, uh, function that adds the uh, uh, points as a layer, right? And so I'm gonna move my, can you see my zoom window? I don't know. All right. Um, so, um, um, let me move this a little bit to the left. All right. Cool. All right so, um, so, that's how we get our concentration on the x axis versus density on the y axis. You can see that there's some default options that are very different between base R and G plus two. If we get like by default on ggplot2, we get some grid lines, we get a gray background, we get solid uh, black points. Um, if we compare back to figure 3.2, um, we had here um, empty uh, black circles uh, and we had no grid lines on our plot, right? Um, um, so the grid lines are can be quite useful if you want to get an idea of you know what are the x and y coordinates for this point, right? Leo, you actually want. I have a question. Mm -hmm. I think we can give aesthetics to the geom point also, right? Um, aesthetics, you mean? Yeah. Um, so you can do more complicated things, yes. Um, but normally, all the aesthetics you specify them to the ggplot function. Um, is there uh, a difference in giving the aesthetic in ggplot versus G geom point? So it's best to just specify all the aesthetics at the, at the front on the ggplot function. Um, because 
if you specify aesthetics inside geom point and then let's say you use geom line then you have to specify them again right so you have to specify them twice okay um, um and so if you specify them at the front on the ggplot2 function they're um they're going to be the common aesthetics uh, for all your layers uh specifying uh Specific aesthetics to a one layer can be useful if you're plotting data from multiple sources. And the one scenario where you might be plotting data from multiple sources is maybe you have a data frame with the X and Y points, but then you also have another one that has text labels, right? Um, um, and so that that is a scenario where you're plotting information from two different input tables. Um, but that's a more complicated scenario. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, okay. So, okay. So we have our graph. Uh, but like ggplot is very useful for exploratory data analysis because you can easily change um, the layers that you're using for visualizing the data um, and get different graphs. Um, now. Uh, the next example they have here is using a different data set, the groups table, the groups table that we made earlier here. Um, um, that has a sample group, the number of unique samples, and the color for it. Um, and so using that table, we can specify on the x-axis we want to have the sample groups. On the y-axis, we want to have the number of unique samples. Um, and then we can say like, oh, we want to actually visualize the data as bars. So uh, this is where the geom underscore bar function comes into play. Um, so that's how you can get, get this figure on the right. You'll notice that like the la our labels are too big, so they overlap each other on the text. Um, and there's ways you can, you can get around this. Um, um, but those are the concepts of ggplot2. Um, all right, so, um, but, um, you know, that is a basic graph. Maybe we want to do something nicer. So let's try to make this figure on the right side, 3.8. So you'll notice, uh, if, before looking at the code, right, we can notice that we still have uh, the number of unique samples as n on the y-axis. We still have the groups on the x-axis. We still have bars. but uh, we're going to change the labels. They're going to be vertical instead of horizontal. We're also going to have different colors for, for each of the bars. And we're going to have a little um, legend on the right side. Um, so um, sometimes looking at the different, like if you're looking at a book or um, a, you know, a tutorial that explains the plots, I sometimes look at the visual differences that I notice between one figure and the other before looking at the code differences. Because then you can then you can try to find like, oh, I need to have at least one code difference that specifies that the x-axis labels are now vertical. I need to have another code difference for the colors, potentially another uh, difference for the, for the legend, right? Um, so that makes it easier for me to, to have a list of things I need to find on the code. So if we look at the code, we actually start the same with ggplot groups. We have sample group as the x variable and as the y variable. But now we have a new aesthetic called fill. This fill is going to be sample group. And, um, and OK, so right now we just have something new called fill. Like, um, um, and it's potentially be the, the color that fills the bars, right? Um, but. Um, um, but we haven't, you know, maybe there's more information about it. Um, we still have uh, a bar that has, uh, uh, just that just shows that number, uh, our number n. Um, that's we're using the function, the identity function that just returns you that same value. So that's the same as before. But now we have two new lines on our uh, GG plot uh, uh, function call. We're actually using something called scale fill manual. So you'll notice here fill as an aesthetic and fill over here gets repeated. Right? Uh, so we actually can identify the function that is controlling 
how we're filling the colors inside of it. Um, and so a scale field manual has a, an argument called values, which actually specifies what colors we have. And because our table has, um, uh, if we go back to our groups table, we have a column that has hex color codes, right? We can just use that directly. Um, um, uh, and so that's our group color column. Um, but now you'll notice that uh, like on our legend, it's called groups, not group color, right? And that's because maybe for us on the code side, group color is our you know, nice identifiable variable. But like for the plot itself, maybe we want to make it simpler for people to understand. So we're just going to give it a name that is um, uh, that is not that they can interpret it without having to look at the code, right? Um, uh, so so far we can see how we've added color to the bars, how we've added the legend and changed the title of the legend. Uh, but we haven't actually changed the 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 x-axis um, 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 the, the, the text direction for the x-axis ticks, right? So initially they were horizontal and they overlapped each other. Um, and so this next line actually does that, right? And if you just read it, you just read the code the first time, you're like, oh, I'm not 100% sure what that does, right? But if you know what the two plots look like, is, is that actually makes it easier to understand. So we have an angle argument here that says 90 degrees, right? And so that makes sense. If we have something that is flat and we just rotate it 90 degrees, we're gonna get something that is vertical, right? Um, 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 and then where are we doing this? We're doing it to something called the axis text for the X uh, axis, right? So this, you know, this is really uh, specific now, and you know, we knew that we were we were looking for something on the x-axis, right? So this makes understanding that argument fairly straightforward. Um, we didn't actually have to look into all the details of what the team function does, right? We can just see like, oh, here they're specifying the properties of the text for the x-axis. What are those properties? We're saying that it's going to be a text element with a 90 degree shift. The final argument is this one called um, H just for horizontal justification. Um, and that like, I think is, um, if I remember correctly, that is like, um, um, I think that's the space below the tick. Um, I think so, is that right? I think it is. Okay. Yeah, I think it actually stands for adjustment, like, each, right. like horizontal adjustment. Thank you, Luis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, because there's another one sometimes called V just uh, for vertical. Um, um, so um, so now you get a you know a much nicer looking plot. Maybe this is the one we want to include as a supplementary figure in our paper, right? Um, uh, although like maybe some of you will be like, hey, like the text is still quite small. Can we make it bigger, right? And so we can we can do that next. Um, so that's you know the power of ggplot2. Um, um, now uh, something else that we've used quite a bit is the fact that ggplot returns objects. Um, that you can then modify actually before you print them, right? And printing an object is when you actually visualize the figure. Um, and so in this particular case, they're saving to an object called gg, uh, the output of ggplot plus gg on point. And that is very useful and that's why we used it last week when we were uh, using Plotly, for example, because Plotly has a function that takes the objects from ggplot2 and modifies it and it actually is, is you know, Plotly has a function that enables that object to become an interactive visualization, right? Um, but you can do a lot of things. And that's how you can expand uh, ggplot to do uh, more stuff for you. Uh, something that we haven't seen uh, or I haven't mentioned, I think, 
is the ggsafe function, which is a way of exporting your, uh, your plot into, let's say, a PDF. Um, I don't necessarily use the ggsafe function. I use a lot of the PDF function and the uh, device.auth function, but uh, gg, ggplot has that function to ggsafe. Um, um, and Susan and, and Wolfgang talk about it, some of the um, some of the properties um, of ggsafe, but you can actually say like ggsafe into a, a .pdf or a .png, for example. Um, saving if you have a very complicated looking plot that has a lot of points, if you save it to a .png, that can be quite useful because um, it's going to be a lot smaller and you're gonna be able to visualize that image a lot faster. If it's a PDF, it's gonna, um, you're gonna be able to zoom in into your plot and like have it very high resolution, um, uh, which is not the case for a PNG, but you're gonna, um, the trade-off is that you're gonna make a much larger file. And so this, this comes into play, you are making um, plots that have like, let's say over 10,000 points or something like that. Um, um, Okay. Um, so let's look into more complicated ggplot stuff you can do. Um, um, you can work with more than one data set, kind of like what uh, uh, my answer earlier to Maddie involved. Um, you can work with multiple layers. So you can work with points, lines, things like that. Um, multiple scales, so you can you know, look at stuff on a linear scale, logarithmic, stuff like that. Um, um, if you're summarizing, summarizing data, you can also use uh, different uh, statistical summaries and many other options that, I mean, like there's, there are books about ggplot too, right? <laughs> uh, um, so we don't need to know all of them off the top of our, uh, of, of the top of our head right now. So let's jump into, um, into some actual code and graphs. So um, we're still working with our X object from that um, uh, 2013 Bioconductor package. Um, and um, I mentioned before that P data is the equivalent to what we now use as cold data. Uh, for our summarized experiment objects. And um, the equivalent to assays uh, counts uh, uh, for summarized experiment objects is um, bio-based XPRS, which is expression. Um, this is how you could access the expression values from a microarray data set in the past. I mean, I mean, you can still do it, right? But, uh, this was very common to do in the past. Um, so we're going to extract the expression matrix here. Uh, they need to actually modify it a little a bit in dimensions, so they're transposing it, um, which is a little bit annoying. But right, they're just getting the data into um, into the same dimensions as our phenotype data. Once they do all of that, then they merge them together into a single table, um, and so they call this table. BFTX, which I think is like a data frame transcript, right? So now that I have a little table, um, we can look at the expression values for two different um, genes, let's say, or, uh, or transcripts. And here we're gonna use some of those um, I, uh, microarrays, uh, uh, instead of measuring genes, they measure specific probes. So these were specific sequences. Um, and so um, there's two different IDs here. One is X142 plus some digits, and the other one is X141, right? Um, so we're gonna look one of them on the X axis, another one on the Y axis, right? We're still using our ggplot function with our um, now table of data, DFTX. Uh, and we wanna, now that we specify what we have on the X and Y uh, axis, uh, we can then say like, okay, what do we actually want to visualize? So let's say we want to visualize points, but also a statistical summary of how those points are related 
And so we're going to add a line, a smoothed line. So we're going to use the geom underscore point function and the geom underscore, underscore smooth function. Each of those, we're going to change a little bit some of the default parameters. So uh, normally the points in ggplot2 are solid points, right? They're uh, completely uh, dark inside. And so we use shape equals one. That's going to change that point to be a circle that is empty. That is a lot you know, closer to the base R graphics. Um, and that can be useful because maybe you have two points that are overlapping each other. Um, you'll be able to notice them that they're overlapping. And if they're completely, you know, fill circles, you won't, you'll maybe just notice, your I might just notice a big point instead of the two points that are, uh, that are overlapping each other. <sighs> and, and uh, the smoothed line, there's multiple methods we can do that. One of them could be a linear regression. Uh, that maybe we just want to see the linear regression between our x and y variable. But there's another method called low s, um, uh, which uh, let's remember what that stands for. Um, uh, yep. Low s regression. Uh, local re regression. Mm. Uh, local estimated scatter plot smoothing. Okay. Yeah, that's an acronym that I didn't remember. <laughs> um, all right. Um, and so this type of regression, what it does is that it takes a small neighborhood of points and tries to find like what is the line that explains that small neighborhood of points and it takes another small neighborhood of points and continues the line etc so that's how you can get a small like a, a line that, le that looks a little bit more curved right um, instead of just a, a, a straight line a straight like linear regression line um, and so the end result here is that we, we get our x and y variables with the uh, with a default like um, uh, gray background with uh, grid lines, we did change the points to be uh, to have um, uh, to just be the small circle instead of the of the the, um, the dark circle, and we added that blue line, which is our uh, lowest regression line, and now we see a little gray band to it, and that's the. Um, uh, other questions in the chat? Oh. No. All right. Uh, um, do you see the chat when I showed it? No, oh, okay. Um, so yeah, there was a bit of discussion about us. Um, the age just argument. <laughs> Uh, anyway, this gray band that we see over here is um, gives us an idea of uh, the error around our line. Um, and so the tighter that is, the, the, the closer it is to the blue line, the more confident we are that it's just that area. Um, but when we have less data, then it, the, the confidence, um, we lose confidence and um, and the gray band looks wider, or if the data is highly variable, like over here, right? There's a, you know, points are quite high, so they're quite low. Then we get a much larger band, right? Um, so th that's a pretty, you know, nice looking plot um, where we had to use some um, um, arguments for layers. We had to use the shape argument and the method argument. But we can try to make this a little bit nicer. And so one way that we can do it nicer is we have the color right, for our samples. And so we can add that. And so <clears throat> uh, let's say we just want to add the color to the points. So this is one of those examples where we're using aesthetics inside of GM points. So we just want to have colors on points, not points and lines. So we're going to specify the aesthetics here to say, we want a color for the points, and we want that to be our sample color color. Um, now, if we just color the circles that are not, in the, they're not um, filled, we would only color the border of the circles, right? And so um, that might, 
be hard to see. So we're going to use a different type of shape, which is the, the fill circle, which is shape number 19. Um, um, and uh, that's how you're going to get points here that have, that are completely filled um, and where the color is just the, the, our sample group. Um, now, by default, if you specify an aesthetic for, let's say, color, it's going to add a legend that says, like, oh, these are the colors that we have. Um, and maybe we don't want that you know, on, our, on our plot because uh, maybe we already know what the colors are because we already imagine that you're presenting that uh, scatter plot next to this bar graph, for example, right? So maybe you don't need to repeat the colors in every single plot that you're making. Um, and so here we can use the function scale, scale color discrete and specify that we don't want a legend. Um, and in this particular case, um, that is uh, done by using the, uh, the guide argument and setting it to false. Uh, so that's how we can, can get this graph. And now we can see that uh, actually like we have a relationship that is um, between our probe 142 and 141 that is dependent on our sample group, right? If we're in the purple sample, sample group, there's almost no relationship. It's kind of like flat over here. Um, let's say we're looking at the teal group. That's a little bit like tilted. Uh, the pink one is actually kind of like, um, we have a little uh, trend, but it's the opposite sign, right? It's increasing instead of decreasing. Um, uh, or let's say this green one doesn't seem to be related much because we have a lot of values here on the x-axis and they don't seem to be related to the y-axis, right? So um, it's probably like a batch effect type of thing happening in our data, right? Um, all right, so let me skip some of that stuff. Um, are, are there any questions so far? Um, so yeah, like after this, they, they start working with like um, adding G names, for example. So like uh, that probe ID 142 and 141, they correspond to the genes F and 1 and TIMD2, right? So um, um, uh, you can use those names instead of the instead of the original uh, labels we had, right? Because people will know the symbols way more than they're going to know the probe IDs. Right? They'll, they'll be able to interpret them. Um, all right. So um, so let's look at our plot. Um, Mm, I, I'm going to skip some of that because that's about how you can make plots. So, uh, build them slowly. Um, okay, so uh, the next thing is uh, that I wanted to mention is the box plots. Um, so this is something that, this is a type of plot that we use a lot. And so <clears throat> here we're going to use a data set that is called genes. It has a variable for the gene ID and then another variable for the expression of it. Um, um, and then we have different like uh, uh, gene names for it. Um, so we save that object, uh, the base object, um, that is the ggplot, the output of ggplot with aesthetics into, a, into let's say call it P. We can later uh, explore how that data looks with different layers. So we can then explore how um, the, the data gets visualized if we use the box plot layer. And so that leads to figure 3.12 over here. Uh, is it 3.12? I think so, yeah. Uh, no, sorry, not 3.12, 3.17, sorry. Um, um, so we see here now we have um, a box plot of the expression for our uh, for our four genes, um, um, and the, this is the default um, 
box plot with like some of the default colors that we have. Um, so like we have red, green, blue, and purple. Um, and this is, you know, a lot of people um, uh, think that box plots are really useful for, uh, for summarizing the distribution of expression. However, uh, people have spent a lot of time looking at box plots and they've noticed that they have some flaws. Uh, one of the flaws is that a box plot doesn't really show you the data. Um, so we don't actually know how many points went behind um, this uh, red bar for the first gene. Um, we know that, for example, GATA4 has a like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, around like 12 outliers to on the high axis, on the y axis. Um, uh, but still, like, um, it's, we're missing some information about how much data do we have. So, um, one way of addressing this is the BioLean layer. So, this is inspired by a, GG, by a box plot layer. But what the idea of this is, um, is let's take a density plot. So that's like a histogram. And, let, and we're gonna mirror it across, um, across the x-axis. So uh, just, let me just find an image of a density plot. So we're gonna find like that density plot over here. Uh, and we're just going to mirror it, so we'll duplicate it. And instead of showing it as um, as um, um, uh, with density on the y-axis, uh, it's going to be rotated 90 degrees. And so that's how we can get those violin plots over here. So we have small density plots, and you'll notice they're mirrors. Um, um, and so some people like them. Actually, some people really hate violin plots. Um, and uh, if you know, if you learn the reason why people don't like violin plus, you probably won't like them either. Um, so I actually avoid violin plus myself. Um, um, but um, um, without getting into the details of why violin plots are not good, um, uh, we can see some of the advantages that it has over uh, box plot. And in particular here, we see that there's a little bit of data uh, for uh, for uh, FGF4 gene uh, at low expression values, we have some like scattered data on the top, but we don't really have anything in the middle here around like let's say six or so, and that's something that we couldn't see with our box plot um, that we can see with the violin plot. Um, for um, GATA4. We knew that we had a lot of data concentrated on this area with some outliers on the top, and that can be that is reflected by this shape over here. Right? Um, so uh, that's one way of seeing it. But uh, um, uh, a better way, though, or an alternative way, is what is called the B swarm plots. Um, so uh, for this, there's a package called GGB swarm. Uh, where you specify um, what is the variable that you're going to have on your um, um, let me see uh, mm. Okay, so I guess we're saying here that we want to have data that is um, on the y-axis. Um, uh, we want each of our um, um, sections of data to have a width of one sixth. We want the data to be centered, um, and then we can specify some properties about our V swarm. Um, so I don't know. I don't actually know what the stack ratio is doing here. Once we have all of that, then uh, 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 that's how we can get 
this uh, bee swarm on the left side, but that's quite complicated because we're using this geom dot plot and we're specifying a lot of properties for it. Um, and if we don't want to know all those arguments and all those properties, the geom b swarm from the ggb swarm package um, already does that for us fairly easily. So I would probably use this instead of the previous solution, unless you want to really customize how your B swarm looks. Um, and so what is this doing? Um, so this actually plots every single data point you have as a dot. Um, and you have a lot of data that has the same Y axis, then it keeps adding it to the left. And that's how you end up with like this, um, like little like branches on your tree type of thing. Um, so for example, if I go, uh, oops, mm, I was playing around with the zoom settings. Um, just trying to make the plot bigger. Um, so let's see if I can annotate this. Right, so we have a little bar over here. Um, there's a lot of data there at that range, right? So th that's what I meant by those little branches, right? Um, um, so bee swarms are quite useful. Um, and, uh, um, that's basically what we have time for today. They, they explain a little more of the plots um, on this book. Uh, but I think at this point, you know, that gives you a lot of power to visualize um, distributions of data. Um, and here we can, you know, see a lot more in detail the data that we have, where we have data, where we don't have measurements. And so that can give us a better idea of how different the, the profiles in this case of expression are for our four genes um, instead of what we saw with our box plots over here. Um, and definitely way better than having bar plots with error graphs. Um, um, so let me stop recording. Uh,